Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to Asia House. I'm Michael Lawrence. Very good to see you here today. And we are delighted to welcome back to Asia House His Excellency uh, Liu Xiaoming, China's ambassador to the UK. The ambassador will be in conversation this morning with Lord Stephen Green, the chairman of Asia House. And Stephen Green is, of course, the former CEO and chairman of HSBC and a former UK trade minister. This is a unique opportunity to hear the views of these two distinguished leaders, and I thank them both for being here today. Now, this is an open and unscripted conversation. It follows last week's UK-China economic and financial dialogue. It comes ahead of this week's G20 meeting in Japan uh, amid escalating trade tensions between the US and China. These are just some of the issues I expect will come up in the conversation. I'll ask both gentlemen to set the scene to make, by making a few opening remarks, and then they will chat. Later in the session, we'll invite you to take part in the conversation, so you'll be asked to, to join in. Again, our sincere thanks to the Ambassador for joining us this morning and taking part in this conversation. In fact, we should welcome both of the gentlemen to the stage. And with that, I'll ask Lord Green to make a few opening remarks, then he'll invite the ambassador to do so, and then they'll talk. Thank you. Michael, thank you very much. Um, uh, and Ambassador, you're very welcome. Again, at Asia House, you're a, you're a regular and distinguished visitor here, and it's always great to have you uh, join us. Uh, this is a slightly unusual occasion. We don't very often have a sort of conversation on the podium uh, uh, with uh, one of the ambassadors uh, in London, um, but we do do it from time to time. But there is no more distinguished ambassador uh, in London than Ambassador Liu. And, of course, there is no country more important to um, <clears throat> everything about Britain in the coming decades than China. And so uh, a dialogue, a conversation about Chinese-British relationships, about Chinese-European relationships, about the trade order, about the challenges to the trade order, uh, about uh, shared interests uh, in the uh, fragility of the planet. There are all sorts of directions we can take this conversation. Uh, I just want to set the stage extremely briefly uh, by uh, summarising the context of this conversation um, <clears throat> I'm going to keep it extremely brief because what I'm saying is familiar to everybody who, who gives even a moment's thought to uh, the, uh, uh, the, the modern geopolitical and economic context. Uh, the world has seen over the last 30 years or so a huge shift of the centre of gravity from west to east. Uh, the rise of Asia in general and of China in particular is the great fact about the first half at least of this century. Um, it poses all sorts of questions for us, and I deliberately use the word us as Europeans, um, uh, i.e. not uh, the British have, have a complicated relationship with the rest of Europe, as we all know, um, but the, the rise of China, the shift of the centre of gravity, poses some interesting challenges for us as Europeans, and I suspect that's one uh, uh, feature uh, that will come up in our conversation. It also poses interesting challenges for uh, relationships between China and its own neighbourhood in Asia. And above all, it poses some interesting challenges in terms of the relationship between China and America over all sorts of things, uh, and including, in particular, trade. Trade has dominated the headlines of uh, the likes of the Financial Times for, 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 for weeks or even months now. Um, I think it will continue to do so. Uh, and it's, what, it's a concern that's on everybody's mind uh, as to exactly how that plays out. So that's the wider context. I can think of any number of ways in which this conversation is going to go. It is a conversation. This is not me interviewing the ambassador uh, about China or uh, the ambassador interviewing me about uh, the conservative leadership uh, contest or anything <laughs> like that. Um, this is a conversation about shared interests, shared themes that are going to frankly dominate all the rest of our working lives and those of our children and grandchildren. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Green. Um, it's a great delight for me to uh, come back again to the Asia House. Just as Lord Green said, uh, though I'm not a member of Asia House, but I'm a frequent visitor to the Asia House. I enjoy uh, conversation, join, uh, enjoy your event. And um, I would say that uh, the events organized by 
this house are always perfectly timed. I still remember uh, last year when I was here to talk about uh, China-US trade relations. And two days ago, two days earlier, uh, the two countries reached agreement on the resumption of trade talks. And this year, this time, um, you know, uh, a, there will be a planned meeting between President Xi Jinping and President Trump uh, during a G20 in Osaka. And also, just a few days ago, Vice Premier Hu, Hu Chunhua, was here to co chair with the Chancellor uh, Philip Harman. Uh, for the 10th Economic Financial Dialogue, and there's uh, 69 outcomes completed, uh, including a very sig significant, uh, people call it groundbreaking, I call it milestone agreement of Shanghai London Stock Connect. So um, um, that shows that uh, Asia House is really a leader in following the international development, especially situation in Asia and Pacific. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to have this conversation with the, uh, Lord Green and uh, the members of his Asia House. We have discussed uh, for some time with Lord Green, Michael, about some kind of collaboration to uh, draw the strength of the uh, to have some uh, brainstorming discussion between Asia House and the Chinese Embassy. Uh, but I didn't anticipate that we can have this kind of a very special arrangement of composition. Uh, I quite agree with Lord Green that uh, we are having uh, changes, uh, dramatic changes in the world today and seen in the century. I think the uh, development of China has more and more becoming a focus of the world. Uh, what development of China means to the world, some people regard it as opportunities, others regard it as challenges, still less some people regard it as a threat. So I think we hope that through this com com uh, kind of dialogue, uh, I can present you a true, genuine China and help you with a better understanding of what is going on in China. To put it in a simple way, I think China is, remains committed to a path of peaceful development. We have no intention to challenge or replace someone. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, the current international mechanism serves the interest of the international community. So we work hard to strengthen or to reform the current rule-based international system, including WTO. And we are working with other countries for a better relations, a new type of international relations, and building a community of shared future for mankind. And China will remain committed to reform and opening I think just as President Xi said, China will open even wider to the rest of, of the world. So the, many people are familiar with this Belt and Road Initiative. This really is a new round of opening up for China. So the, I think China presents really a lot of opportunities. And China and UK are two countries of a global influence I think we have every reason to strengthen our collaboration cross world. So I think I should stop here and uh, leave um, uh, the composition and uh, a dialogue with the, uh, uh, the, the audience. Fantastic. Well, thank you. I, I, there, are, there are a number of different ways we could go with our conversation, but I'm, I wonder if we might start off with uh, talking about the um, progress in development internally in China, so the, the progress of economic development. Uh, I, I used to live in Hong Kong, as you know, and I remember going in the 1980s up to the border and looking across the, uh, the, the duck farms and the, and, and the rice paddies uh, at a little 
town called Shenzhen in the middle distance. Um, and uh, it looked sleepy, it was small, um, and it was a very rural, backward uh, economy, by sharp contrast, of course, with Hong Kong at that time. Since then, well, how much has changed? The last time I went to Shenzhen was in November, um, and, I, uh, and if you stand at the, uh, one of the top, top stories of the many skyscrapers in Shenzhen and look across back to Hong Kong, you can't even see where the border is any longer. Um, and also, of course, Shenzhen is probably the most digitized city in the entire world now, uh, where, where, where cash seems to have gone out completely. It's an extraordinary place um, uh, anyway, and all the more extraordinary for those who can remember what it was like in the 1980s. I, it, it, we're all aware, of course, that not all of China is like Shenzhen, and in some ways Shenzhen is the apex of, of Chinese development in, in pure economic and technological terms. Um, and if you go into a British bookshop and you look for the bookshelves marked China, you will see um, books that, 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 that forecast an imminent collapse, a hard landing, um, uh, you know, the, the, the hitting the buffers rather sharply. Um, I think of George Magnus's book, for instance. Uh, or you can find the books that assume that this is all going to be a completely smooth path of development, where China goes on and on growing uh, at, at 6 7 8% a year for the foreseeable future, um, and there will be no significant troubles on the way. My sense is that the truth lies somewhere in between those two, that there are massive challenges uh, uh, and that the authorities in Beijing are very conscious of those massive challenges. The development of the centre and the west, of course, is one. Uh, the, the imbalance between consumption and on the one hand and savings and investment on the other. The, uh, uh, the, 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 the ageing, the demographic challenge within China, which is... Which is uh, extremely severe, um, uh, 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 the, uh, and, and the, even the lifting of the one-child policy still means um, that fertility rates are well below two, and uh, the population is aging quite fast. Um, so there are all sorts of challenges. And then finally, uh, a challenge about resources. China is a country which is relatively resource poor, so its, its extraordinary economic machine has had to be fed by sucking in huge amounts of, uh, of resources. I, I'm very struck by the fact that the, the largest export market of Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Iraq is now China. And by the way, the second largest is India. That's something we might come on to later. Um, uh, and, then, and then, of course, there's the water question, which uh, many people have suggested is going to be a particularly sensitive issue um, in Asia generally over the, over the next half century or so, because unlike Europe, which is certainly not short of water, uh, Asia is short of water, and a number of the key rivers have their origins in China, um, but flow through some other countries, posing some interesting neighbourly challenges. Uh, so my, my sense is that, that, that um, there are enormous challenges, but I don't believe in the hard landing thesis uh, at all. And I, indeed, I think the likelihood is that China will keep on uh, uh, delivering more and more prosperity to more and more of its people for a long period of time. I wonder, uh, do, do you think I'm wrong? Do you think I'm right? Have I missed I something in all of that? I quite agree. With you, I kind of quite agree. I think you answered most of the questions. A hundred percent. I would say um, I agree with you that uh, China achieved uh, remarkable progress in the past 40 years. In the last year, we celebrate the 40-year anniversary of reform opening up. Uh, in the past 40 years, China has been completely transformed. Uh, from being the 10th uh, largest economy to the second largest economy. We have elevated 700 million people out of poverty. Uh, Chinese people living uh, much better, happier, and longer. Yeah. Uh, that's for sure. But having said that, I would say China is, is still a developing country. So per capita GDP, China is still way behind many developed countries. Uh, I think China is still rank the 8th or 79 something. When I first came here uh, as a Chinese ambassador about 10 years ago, I used to, uh, uh, you know, uh, compare with the, the GDP of China with the GDP of Albania. I said China is still behind Albania. 
And uh, some people told me Albanian ambassador is not very happy with this comparison. <laughs> and uh, so I, 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 I would not uh, you know, uh, uh, list any country, but I would say China is still way, comparing with the uh, UK, with other European countries, to say nothing of the United States. We still have a long way to go. Uh, and also, you mentioned many challenges China faced with, uh, including, I think, the, during the 19th Party Congress, uh, the top leadership of China identified uh, the main challenges for China is really the, uh, the, the demand for a better life of the people, uh, uh, the discrepancy between demand and supply. Uh, we still need uh, adequate supply. Uh, the unbalanced development is still the problem faced by China. You mentioned about the, uh, um, the coastal areas, Shenzhen, Shanghai, Guangzhou. But if you go further west, uh, what you know, Americans used to call the Wild West, you know, after my ambassadorship in Egypt, I've been seconded as an assistant governor of Gansu province, one of the poorest provinces in China. You mentioned about water. Shortage of water is a big challenge for Gansu. Many, in many places in Gansu, people still do not have a drinkable water. They use um, uh, you know, a, um, a cell uh, made of cement to catch green water yeah. and to purify yeah. this water for a human being and living stock. Uh, so it's a quite challenge. And people they, they, in the villages still do not have a better access to a decent scoop. So there's an enormous challenges for Chinese yeah. uh, leadership. Um, so that's why, you know, I said at the beginning, we are not uh, interested in uh, replacing anyone because we think we have enough problem uh, at home. Uh, you know, uh, we, uh, though we have elevated 700 million people out of poverty, uh, there's still about 10 million people living under poverty line. And the target is to get those people out of poverty uh, line before the end of, uh, towards, before the end of next year. So even people elevated, uh, you know, out of uh, poverty line is a basic need. There's still way, uh, uh, you know, a lot of work to do uh, to improve the livelihood of Chinese people. Um, so uh, I hope people could understand uh, China has uh, many faces. We have uh, a developed sites like uh, coast areas, look like Europe maybe. You know, you can't tell much difference if you look at Shanghai, Guangdong, and Beijing. Indeed. Many uh, skyscrapers. But if you look at uh, the villages, or even the cities in, in Gansu, in Tianshui, uh, Dunhuang, and other places, look more like uh, you know, African cities. So it's, it's a sharp contrast. So the task for us is to reduce these discrepancies to achieve a more balanced development. I, I'm very conscious of that. I've myself have not been to Gansu province, but I have seen a number of areas of China, rural areas, sometimes even not so far outside the big cities with which we are all familiar. You don't have to go all that far out of Beijing before you find villages that are manifestly much poorer mm -hmm. than, the, the, than what is the image we have of modern urban China. So I'm, I'm very conscious of what you say. It, 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 you said China, China has many faces. I think that's a great way of putting it. Not least because too many people in the West tend to have a, uh, think, think that China is all one face. It's, it's all completely homogenous. It's not. It's a very heterogeneous country. And you, you are deeply conscious of that. The authorities are deeply conscious of that. And, and I've traveled enough around China to be well aware of it too. Uh, of course, it, it, lead, it, it tees up a, a, another interesting question, because when China dis describes itself as a developing country, uh, and, it, and, it, and it's clear what that means, uh, when we, uh, as we have just discussed, the, 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 the backwardness of much of rural China still, um, 
it, it, it sits uneasily with the, the export profile and the trade profile of China, uh, which is, of course, that of a very sophisticated economy, taking on the West um, in all its areas of strength, you know, railway technology, aerospace, uh, uh, digital technology. Uh, Ch China's absolutely up there and equal with um, the offerings of uh, <clears throat> Europe and, and America. Uh, and so in trade discussions, this leads to an obvious sensitivity, doesn't it? Um, and, and, I, uh, and I do worry at the moment about how this will all play out. I, I think we are at risk, uh, we collectively are at risk of seeing the WTO lose authority, lose traction, um, uh, more and more um, uh, bilateral or, or, or regional free trade areas being negotiated. Uh, which in effect undermine or risk undermining or making irrelevant the WTO system. And of course, in Britain's case, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a debate going on, uh, uh, has been going on now for three years at least, and is still not finished, about the nature of Britain's relationship with Europe. And you hear, still hear people saying, oh, well, we can trade perfectly well under WTO rules and so on. Uh, I, I do worry about where the world is headed in terms of trade relationships. Um, I, I think the difficulties are posed by the rise of new economies. China's the most spectacular example, but not the only one. Um, there are smaller ones that are equally uh, uh, have had, made remarkable journeys from um, poor rural economies into sophisticated modern ones, not least South Korea. We, we, we forget that in, in the 1960s, South Korea was as poor as the democratic, or what is now called the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, look at it now. Um, uh, so, so it's not just China, but it is, China's the biggest and most dramatic example, poses a challenge for the, for the order. And then on the other hand, you've got a, a rise of what you can only describe as a populist, anti-trade, uh, protectionist sentiment, in, you know, famously in America. Um, I, I personally think that we are sometimes, uh, we sometimes fall into the trap of assuming this is all about Trump. Um, and that when Trump goes away, whether it's because he doesn't get a second term or, or if he does, then, then in five years' time, um, it'll all revert to normal. I don't think that's true. I think that there's a more deep-seated uh, protectionism and a more cross-Congress sense that they're losing ground and need to be more um, uh, uh, strategically assertive, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China, um, and it would be wrong to assume this is simply Trump and, and right-wing republicanism. It's something more general in the American view of the world at the moment. So that's a cluster of things um, which are tangled up with each other and lead me to worry about future world growth um, and the ability of the world to sort out these difficult technical trade issues in a, in a, in a rational manner that benefits us all. Does, does any of that ring true with you? Yeah, I share your concerns. I think, again, you answer most of the questions. <laughs> um, we are faced with the challenges. Uh, I think uh, we are concerned about the rise of uh, unilateralism, protectionism. Um, you know, uh, this uh, WTO uh, uh, as a core uh, and other international uh, mechanism system, uh, we believe still form the basis uh, to govern the world trade. Uh, though it's not perfect, uh, we support reform. Uh, but I think right now you don't have uh, the better international mechanism than WTO to regulate trade, to facilitate trade, uh, since uh, uh, we are in the uh, 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 global village. Have, uh, we all have to do business to do trade. So we need some rules. Yeah. You know, if every country take rule in their own hand, or believe their country first, other countries second, or maybe even down the road, you know, there certainly will, will be ended up with a trade war and trade frictions. Uh, it will be bad for world trade, bad for the growth of uh, uh, the world economy. So we are, first of all, uh, support WTO, support rule-based international uh, system. Uh, we also support the reform of the mechanism. Uh, but when it's come to reform, you need to build consensus. 
of the international community. It might take longer time, but you will pay a lower price. And thirdly, we believe a win-win. We don't think a winner should take all. Uh, we don't believe in zero-sum game. We believe we are in a community of a shared future. Um, so that's, that's how China look at the, the current uh, world situation and relations between nations. So I think only based on win-win cooperation, we can achieve win-win results. I, I like that phrase, community of shared future, which of course is, uh, one has heard, well, uh, uh, Xi Jinping uh, has used that phrase in, in a number of times. It in, has been incorporated yeah. into UN document yeah. as well, yeah. and many, including G20. Yeah, mm. yeah. Uh, and and uh, the community of the shared future is a statement of fact. Uh, we are a global community with a shared future, kind of whether we like it or not. Um, and uh, I think we should embrace it. But I wonder whether, uh, w whether your sense is of optimism or pessimism about the ability to, uh, let's say, over the next 10 to 20 years, to make s significant progress in that direction. I feel cautiously optimistic. Um, I think there's uh, enormous common interest uh, between, among nations to work together. Uh, I agree with you that uh, what is going on in the United States is not an individual uh, phenomenon. Uh, there's a broader uh, background of uh, uh, this anti-globalization, uh, unilateralism, protectionism. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, I do hope common sense will yeah. prevail. Yeah. When people pay the price, when people saw the consequences, the negative consequences of a trade war, trade. In fact, uh, I think the United States uh, uh, will not be the winner. I don't think there will be a winner from trade war. And both countries will suffer. But according to some predictions, US might suffer most. Uh, so uh, I, 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 I read some of the uh, uh, report that uh, uh, in the past few days, uh, trade representative US tried to solicitating I solicited opinions, uh, 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 there's a hearing, uh, 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 you know, session, uh, instead of uh, uh, getting support of uh, uh, tariffs, uh, they heard a lot of complaints. Uh, so I, I think uh, we are working for win-win. We are not want to have a lose-lose result. So at the end of the day, to answer your question, in a simple way, I hope common sense will prevail. I hope common I interest the view. will prevail. <laughs> I, I certainly share the view. Um, a, a community of shared interest, one, one of the regions of the world where a community of shared interest is, in my view, uh, both obvious as a fact and extremely important as a goal, is Europe. Um, uh, you, you, you're looking at a person who um, was a Remainer, is a Remainer, deeply regrets of course, this country has chosen to follow. Um, it's part of a wider context about Europe and, and the way in which Europe engages in this new world that we've described. So you've got a, you've got a, um, a, a let's say, a world stage where in the 19th century it was dominated by the colonial powers, Britain, Germany, France, Austria, Russia, and so on. Um, and uh, we've still got a world stage now, the, the, the large, the great powers, the large, important countries, except the membership of the world stage is now different, of course. You've got America, of course, that's not going to go away, China, I think India, um, and uh, a question about Japan, um, a country we don't talk enough about, uh, and we tend to forget that China, uh, Japan is still the world's third largest economy and a highly sophisticated one. Um, uh, I'd like to come back to Japan, maybe, but I'm interested in your perspective on the European question in that context. So if there's a world stage, is Europe on that? And if so, can it, does it speak with a single voice? Um, how do, does it have a coherent identity on the world stage? Uh, we, the Europeans, live at one corner of the Europe Eurasian landmass, um, which before 1500 was just a reasonably insignificant corner of it, but then became, for reasons we all understand, much more influential. Um, um, uh, but since 1989, it's lost strategic priority in the Americans' minds, 
because we are no longer the continent that has the fault line of the Cold War running through it. Um, uh, it's losing ground relatively, not absolutely, but relatively economically compared with China. I mean, in a sense, that's just an obvious consequence of the rise of developing countries. You'd expect the share of Europe to lose ground. But it's more than that somehow. There's also a loss of a sense of coherence, purpose, identity, um, uh, an anxiety about where competitive strengths lie in the world to come uh, 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 over, the next, over the next few decades. And then there's specifically um, a problem of populism in a number of countries and specifically vis-a-vis um, -vis the EU, of course, a British question. I, I'm we, we, all, we all spend endless hours debating all of this. Um, I, I'm interested in what a Chinese perspective on all that is. It, it, do, does China, in the end, look at Europe and simply say it is just a collection of countries that are differently interesting? And you know, there's Germany, there's the largest economy and an industrial machine that's still extraordinary. There's Britain with all its financial acumen and, and various other strengths um, and so on. Or does it see any actuality or desirability of some kind of collective European identity on the world stage. I'd, I'd be very interested in what the kind of yeah, Chinese this is, uh, perspective This is a very complicated issue. Uh, <laughs> you need to spend the whole day you know, to discuss about uh, Europe and China-European relations. Uh, first, I would say China still regards Europe, EU, as uh, a very important uh, force uh, in the world. Uh, you know, we always believe a multi-polarized system is more stable yeah. than single-polarized po yeah. or even try a bi-polarized world. And so we see uh, Europe as a strategic force uh, for stability, prosperity. Uh, EU now is China's largest trading partner. United States comes second, as a matter of fact, but now because of the trade war you know, with China, US now turned to the third largest trading partner taken over by ASEAN countries as a group. Um, so we see Europe still very, as very important stabilizer uh, in the world, uh, in the changing world, and still important partner for China, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, in strategic perspective and also in, in trade, economic, perspective. So we attach great importance to our relations with Europe, uh, including institutions, uh, organizations uh, based, council based in Brussels, and we're also working uh, very well with the individual countries. UK, now you are still within uh, uh, EU, and Germany, France, Italy, and other countries. We have this uh, uh, 16 plus 1 uh, dialogue uh, and presidency, uh, I think the most countries, uh, Chinese leadership uh, made uh, uh, European countries and he was in uh, France uh, uh, a few months ago. Uh, in addition to his state visit to France, he met with uh, Merkel and also uh, Chancellor Merkel and also the uh, Janka and other uh, European leaders to reaffirm our commitment to stronger partnership between China and Europe. Uh, of course, uh, we watch uh, what is going on now uh, in, uh, in Britain. Uh, we certainly, we leave a Brexit to UK and the EU. Uh, we <laughs> believe you are intelligent enough, uh, you are wise people, you can work out something, and uh, right. certify uh, and to, uh, to, 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 to both sides. And uh, uh, so China wants to have good relations uh, with both UK and with the EU. We do hope yeah. that uh, you can work out a solution. And so um, uh, the relationship between China, UK, relationship between China and EU, uh, EU remains strong. Uh, so that's a short answer. I, I, this is a very complex question. I, I, I'm struck by some of the signals coming out of both Brussels and Germany uh, um, in, in recent months, which almost sound as if they're teetering in the 
direction of America in terms of attitude towards uh, the China relationship, if I can use that phrase. So you have the uh, German equivalent of the CBI, the BDI, uh, talking about essentially, essentially strategic threat of the rise of, uh, of the most sophisticated parts of the Chinese economy. And of course, <laughs> the truth is that if you look at electric cars, for example, China has uh, a clear lead and thus is a threat to the core of German industry, their great car industry. So you can see why they might be um, inclined in that general direction. And then you have seen the commission uh, produce documents that, uh, that, that that's almost sounded uh, uh, like they're using a sort of a, 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 an elegant, more diplomatic um, uh, language to express some of the same sentiments that you get coming out of America. Does, does that concern... Whereas, by contrast, so far, at any rate, the British orientation has been... I, uh, I, I don't know whether you would agree with this, but it seems to me that the British orientation has been pragmatic, wanting to engage. Um, the, the British government was the first to take up a uh, shareholding in the AIIB. Um, uh, the, the relationship has not always been smooth and there are some complexities we, we shouldn't kid ourselves nevertheless uh, a, a desire to keep open and pragmatic in the relationship uh, I, I don't know whether this will continue um, and I don't know whether this means that there is a growing divergence between a kind of EU view and a British view I hope not actually mm. um, but it does suggest that uh, and, and, and one other thought in, in that context is that, again, my Brussels friends and my Berlin friends are certainly nervous about the 16 plus 1 dialogue because of those 16, of course, about 11 of them are members of the EU um, and, it, uh, and they worry about what this means in terms of, uh, um, of, of, of the, the specifics of Chinese engagement. It, it, what would your um, perspective on that? Yeah, I think that sometimes there might be some misunderstanding, uh, like you said, the German suspicion of uh, 16 plus 1. Uh, we try to communicate with them, uh, try to explain to them that is in the best interest, not only in China, but also in the best interest of EU. Uh, 16, uh, you mentioned about 11 countries, most of them are less developed you know, uh, countries comparing they're, they're with all the, the, the eastern yes, end of yes. Europe. So that means we have more common interests, you know, when China is a developing country. So we have, uh, we enjoy the uh, uh, prosperity for, uh, priority for development. Um, I, I think, um, you know, here in UK, I, I think UK, uh, the, uh, the majority view uh, is looking at China as opportunities rather than as challenges. Uh, even less as a threat. But you also heard, uh, I would put it as a noise. You know, you have uh, some forces uh, calling for taking China, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, to take US, uh, to take the side of US to challenge China. So that's why we from time to time have uh, some problems, but the mainstream, I would say, still working for the golden era between China and the UK. So um, when it's come to other European countries, even in Germany, you also have a forces calling for stronger relations with China. I think on the whole, the leadership in the German government working very hard, uh, working for the common good between China and uh, 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 Germany. So uh, you, you don't have uh, uh, unified views. Uh, it's uh, complicated. Uh, so we need to engage more actively uh, with the countries, with the people, to explain uh, what China is about, to explain what the opportunities China can offer. Uh, I understand people have a suspicion, you know, when you have, uh, 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 you, you just have a limited resources of the world. When you have someone, the latecomer, to come here to compete, uh, people ha has a reason to be concerned about that. So we explain to them, we are here for cooperation. We are not a new colonial power. You know, in old days, when you have a, a country uh, arise, you know, they are looking for resources in the world. Uh, the most of them, the, the, the old power, resort to war uh, 
you know, you have an open war against China, Indeed. and you have many colonial wars. One of the more shameful aspects of British history. <laughs> so we, we, don't, we don't believe this, uh, what they call the Thucydides trap. Yeah. You know, emerging power will challenge the existing power. Yeah. Uh, so China will not follow the beaten path. I, I have to say, I don't believe in the Thucydides trap either, not least because we live in a nuclear age. You, you can't afford to fall over the abyss, the edge of the abyss, in the way that happened in 1914, um, because the price would be truly terrible. So we can't go there. We have to, in that sense, have to be optimistic that the community of shared future, to use Xi Jinping's language, uh, will and become I can't a believe political reality. Our generation are wiser than our previous generation. I certainly hope so. And I think we have more knowledge. Yeah. We know the we world do. better. We do. Uh, and we believe uh, yeah. the common interests yeah. will prevail yeah. our differences. Yeah. We do. I, I, I'd love to raise just two other countries. Um, yeah, please, go ahead. Europeans always uh, run the risk of assuming that Europe is the centre of the world and talking about nothing else than Europe's relations with the rest of the world. I want to ask you about India and then briefly about Japan, and then we probably ought to uh, uh, let, let the audience into our conversation. India's, uh, to me, uh, first of all, it's a fascinating country. I've been to India many times. I love it. Um, I feel that if I went there every year for the rest of my life, it's like peeling an onion. You will never have got to the core of it. It's so, so varied. Such an extraordinary place. Um, this last election um, in India, when, when the conventional assumption was that Modi would win, but by a weakened majority from the previous time, would find it more difficult to build support in, in Parliament, how wrong we were. Uh, he, he won a, a, an absolutely outstanding victory, despite a relatively mixed economic record. He's, he's achieved some things, unquestionably, um, but, but it's a mixed economic record, and, and uh, increasingly you're hearing voices in India that suggest that the growth rate is not as striking as the official statistics suggest that it's been. Um, um, they have a huge demographic problem. It's exactly the opposite of the Chinese problem. Um, it's a, uh, uh, and he traded, of course, on a, a very assertive cultural um, nationalism, a, a Hindu nationalism, in a way that uh, is, is very un, uh, sits very uncomfortably with the founding principles of the modern India. Um, they are nervous about the Belt Road Initiative. They, 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 you hear the language of encirclement in New Delhi and in Mumbai, less, less in Mumbai, but certainly in New Delhi. Um, uh, this is at or, uh, either already or soon to be the largest economy, the largest country in the world by population, by headcount. Um, it's not got, yet. Not, not quite yet, no. Not, not it, yet. It's heading, heading... But we'll be happy to give uh, this uh, first place to India. This is an honour you would be India. happy to see. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> It, 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 it must, if I were in Beijing, um, thinking about the world around me, I'd be worried, not worried, I'd, be, I'd spend a lot of time thinking about the American relationship for obvious reasons. And then the second one that I'd think most about would be the Indian relationship. Am I right or am I wrong? Uh, India is uh, uh, one of the countries which we care most in Asia, uh, Pacific Asia, that's for sure. Uh, uh, China has been committed to a better relation with India, and uh, uh, we believe that there will be no peace and prosperity uh, in Asia without good relations uh, between China and I'm India. Sure, sure that's right. And uh, <clears throat> uh, India, uh, as a matter of fact, um, I, I think some media, or maybe here in Western media, try to paint uh, uh, no, a negative picture of relation between China and India. You know, they, 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 they would like to pick a fight between China and India. Uh, they're looking for problems. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of uh, good stories between uh, uh, relations, uh, uh, in the relation between China and India. And uh, India is uh, one member of the BRICS. You know, there's a very strong ties uh, between the five countries working for a common good. And uh, the top leadership, President Xi, uh, invest a great deal in the relationship with the Indian Prime Minister. You know, he went out of his way to greet uh, Modi when he visited uh, China. He hosted, uh, he, he hosted him in his hometown in Shanxi. It's very rare for the President to host yeah. a 
prime minister. Normally, you know, he's a counterpart of a Chinese premier. Yes, but you can, yes, you can. He's not the head of state in India. He's not the head of state. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but he's the one who runs the country. Yeah. So uh, uh, President and Modi, they have a very good personal uh, friendship relationship from the very top and on the working level. I think relations are getting stronger and stronger. So uh, uh, we are not that concerned about the relation between China and India. And, and we have so many common interests to work together uh, for the uh, uh, stability, uh, not only in South uh, uh, Asia, uh, um, but also uh, Asia as a whole. And then there's Japan. <laughs> uh, I, I, want to, I want to just ask a bit about Japan um, or reflect a bit about Japan. I, I don't think we in Europe reflect enough about Japan's place in the modern world. It is, as I said earlier, the, the world's third largest economy. It's one of. There is no economy more sophisticated than Japan. Um, it could nuclearize itself in, in a matter of, I don't know what, 18 months if it chose to. Um, I, I remember being in Tokyo a year or two back and um, talking to some Japanese friends, and this was at the time when North Korea was still busy firing off a lot of rockets, uh, including some that sort of passed over Japan. Um, and I remember one of them saying to me, just remember that Pyongyang is eight minutes away from Tokyo by rocket. Mm. Um, and uh, I, I wonder whether we should give more thought to Japan's own perspectives on its uh, fundamental national interests. And in the case of the relationship with China, of course, there's some uncomfortable history. We're, we're all well aware of that. I've been to Nanjing. I have been to the museum in Nanjing um, and the memorial. Uh, there are some uncomfortable aspects of the past, and, and I guess there, are, there, there might be many Chinese people who feel that uh, Japan hasn't kind of come to terms with that past in, 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 in a way that you'd want them to, and in the way that the Germans have, in a quite ex extraordinary way. Um, uh, you've got uh, the Americans now trying to put together a kind of, as it were, coalition of India for one, Japan for another, and, and other Southeast Asian countries, as they call the Indo-Pacific belt. Um, what does China think about the, the Japan relationship? And well, of course, it's one of your biggest investors. Yes, yes. Uh, we certainly uh, want to have a good relation with Japan. It's uh, our largest neighbor uh, across the sea, and uh, China and Japan fought uh, several wars. Uh, we have a, a bitter past, but we do not want to repeat the past. We want to have good relations. Um, but the, as you, I think you already hit the nail at hand when it comes to the problem between China and Japan. You know, um, Chinese people care about uh, this uh, remorse by China, uh, Japanese leaders. When we saw Japanese leaders uh, kept paying respect to the A-class war criminals, just like um, uh, British people watching German leaders paying respect to the Nazi yeah. criminals. So I, I hope I make this comparison, you probably uh, could understand well, exactly our feeling better. better. Yeah. Uh, but we don't think the current generation should pay the price for the previous generation. We want to turn this page, but you need to have a you know, correct attitude. Just when you saw this vivid photo of uh, Chancellor Brandt kneeling down the tomb of the Jew in Warsaw. I think Warsaw, yeah, uh, close to Warsaw. Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, it really put it behind uh, uh, them, and uh, Germany in joint good relation with France, with the yeah. UK. We do hope that uh, uh, we can turn this page, but it's Im very important that the Japanese leaders have to make a solemn uh, uh, statement on that. And also some forces, what we call it, uh, right-wing force trying to uh, uh, correct a textbook to change in history. That's another problem. It's not a problem for China. It's also a problem for Asian countries yes. uh, who have been under Japanese colonial yeah. rule, including yeah. Korean 
and to other uh, Eastern countries. I, I remember when I was living in Hong Kong, there was, a, there was one of those rounds where, where the Japanese Ministry of Education was trying to change the textbooks. Mm -hmm. and, and you suddenly got the perspective of China, South Korea, North Korea, Singapore, and, 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 and some other countries, Malaysia, I think, too, all in unanimous protest about yeah, what's going on. Exactly. Yeah. So I think um, uh, we believe Japan should have its uh, 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 status, uh, a place, uh, in, the, uh, in Asia, in the world. Uh, but I don't think uh, Japan could be a normal country before it uh, come to term with its past. Uh, I, I'm pleased that the relationship between China and Japan improving, and uh, uh, Abe was in China uh, for an official visit, and uh, the relationship uh, pick up momentum. I do hope this Osaka uh, G20 will be another turning point yes. uh, uh, in the relationship between China and Japan. Uh, and I believe that President, will have, uh, President Xi will have a bilateral meeting in addition to attending uh, Osaka G20, will have a bilateral meeting with uh, 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 Prime Minister Abe. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, when we talk about China-Indian relations, there will be no prosperity and peace. Uh, without good same relation, thing. Uh, same thing, with a good relation yeah. between yeah. China and Japan. Yeah. I, I wonder, Ambassador, we, we've had a fascinating conversation. This could go on for hours, but I wonder if we ought to uh, uh, give our audience a chance to jump up with a few questions. Mm, Michael, CEO, enjoying the... And, and the, the, there is a mic, uh, yeah. which Mike has now got, uh, and, and, and will revolve. debate in terms of the, the tensions between the US and China more widely, more, more wider than, than trade, but certainly on technology. Um, is that going to escalate? Uh, what's the Huawei view of this? Because I understand you visited Huawei fairly recently. What's the Huawei view? Uh, and is there a, a, going to be a contagion effect? Are other companies by both countries going to be blacklisted, uh, which will escalate the trade war and the economic damage? Mm -hmm. First, I would say Huawei is a good company. Uh, it's a leader in uh, uh, 5G. And they are very committed uh, to uh, UK market. Uh, uh, Michael is right. You follow my uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> footsteps very closely, <laughs> I, would, I would think. Yeah, I did, I did visit Huawei. And uh, as a matter of fact, I have a meeting with Ren Zhengfei, the founder of Huawei. Uh, they tend to believe UK might be different from US. You know, I, I gave a talk to a University of Huawei. I gave uh, three reasons why I believe UK will act independently in its own interest and in, in the interest of China-UK cooperation. Uh, I think Huawei has been very committed uh, 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 in the past 18 years. They invest a great deal in UK and uh, they employed about 7,500 employees. They invested about uh, 2 billion. They plan to invest another 3 billion for the next five years. But the important thing, uh, they understand that the risk in you know, uh, net uh, working um, cyber security. So this, uh, that's why they voluntarily uh, set up uh, what they call it the cyber security uh, uh, analysis um, um, centre uh, manned completely by British people. They sent no people from Huawei, like the British people, to assess the risk. And uh, uh, the head of uh, this uh, uh, centre, uh, after uh, uh, you know, each year they have this uh, assessment, believe that risk is manageable and um, uh, for any companies, you know, no matter how good you are, there's a risk. But the good thing is the approach, attitude, why we adopt uh, is that they want to uh, improve their technology. They are open. You know, they want to engage with the regulators, re authorities of the UK, and the businesses. Uh, they want to improve their technology. Uh, they want to work with the British uh, uh, businesses. I, so I do hope that uh, uh, UK will keep Huawei for the win-win cooperation. 
and some people predict if uh, Huawei uh, been uh, get rid of uh, got rid of uh, UK, UK might be behind a year and a half. And but that is not my main concern. My main concern that UK has been always regarded as the most open, business friendly. Uh, but if uh, UK get Huawei out, it will send a very negative and bad message, not only to Huawei, but also to Chinese business yeah. uh, as a whole. Uh, just as uh, 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 Lord Green said a moment ago, uh, UK is different. So that I always say uh, Britain is great. Great Britain is great because it can act, make decisions independently, not to follow the order of other people, not to subject to the pressure from outside. Um, there's a question there. Good morning, Mr. My name is Callum Morrison. I'm from uh, Coventry University, London. And around about this time of year, I'm always teaching my students about supply chain. Um, that process where a series of activities, mining, processing, manufacturing, marketing, delivering, and servicing. And every time I deliver these lectures, I remember a conversation I had with you in this institution shortly after you arrived here. I don't expect you to remember it, but you beautifully articulated, um, I felt, uh, China's position at the time. You said to me, Callum, see the world in terms of a supply chain. You said to me, if we look at the supply chain today, for every dollar of Chinese goods that are delivered, five cents remains in China. You said to me, it's five percent. But come, think about the opportunity. If we increase that to six cents, that's a 20% in increase in trade. And if we increased it to 7%, that's a 40%. And of course, with only a, a small increase of 1% or 2%, it's hardly going to excite the competition, the Western companies that have already got the rest of the supply chain. Um, so my, my question to you, sorry, we then carried on, you said, but of course, then we've got to think about infrastructure, we've got to think about skills, we've got to think about relations and so on and so forth to facilitate that production so we can capture more value from the supply chain. This was the nub of our conversation. And it went on for probably an hour, but only about two minutes. But I thank you for the conversation, I always remind you. I'm always reminded of it. And I was reminded of it today when you said, when I first came here, you said, Albania. We compared our economy to Albania. Here we are. Per capita, in, capita income. In per capita income, GDP. In terms of income. <laughs> and our conversation there, maybe GDP. Eight so, years later so, so from that question, conversation, so eight question. years from that, has China, has China improved? Has China taken a larger part of the value chain? Would you be able to put a percentage, as you were able to put on the percentage at that time? 5% now, 20%? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm pleased you still remember <coughs> our conversation. So that shows our conversation make difference. Indeed. And, uh, uh, Indeed. And, and, uh, uh, you are absolutely right. We are making progress. So we are increasing that uh, uh, percentage step by step. Because I don't think Chinese people are satisfied to be always at the low end of supply chain. And I believe that as we uh, make the pie bigger, uh, most people will enjoy a bigger share. So uh, our uh, philosophy is to make the pie bigger. So, uh, so that's why uh, the, the people will enjoy more rather than to cut the pie to pieces and to make the other people loss uh, uh, than you win. That is not our philosophy. So we, um, so I think, um, you know, when I watch China-U.S. Um, trade intention, that reminds me a composition uh, about 25 years ago. You know, I've been posted twice in Washington. Uh, I've been uh, a witness 
or the up and downs in the relationship. I still remember one of the American leaders said this. He said, uh, I care about this trade deficit between China and the US, but I, what I'm going to do is not to reduce China export to US. I want to increase American export to China so that you know, we can make the pie bigger. So I think this pie uh, philosophy uh, is really something we should work together rather than, you know, like uh, a current administration to increase tariffs. As a matter of fact, it's really not, not many people realize, not many American decision makers, current American decision makers realize. It is American business, American importers who will pay for the high tariffs. It is, a, at the end of the day, it's American consumers who will pay the, tef, uh, the tariffs. So um, you mentioned our supply chain. So we are in the uh, uh, interconnected world. You know, uh, the, there's, there's really no such a thing that one side lose is other side's gain. I, I would say there, there will be lose-lose for both. One will have a trade war. I think there was a there and, and then there. Thank you very much. Good morning, Ambassador. It's a pleasure to see you here. You, you spoke just now about China's respect for rules-based global order, echoing actually the words of General Secretary Xi Jinping. Uh, against that background, I wanted to ask you about something you said the other day on Newsnight, talking about the Hong Kong Joint Declaration, which, as you know, has the status of an international treaty registered with the United Nations, a treaty between China and Britain, which transferred sovereignty over Hong Kong to China, but also established that, that Hong Kong would be part of one country, two systems for 50 years to come. You said that the joint declaration was no longer relevant. Could you please explain no, what not, you meant? Not, that is not my word. You know, I think it's a misinterpretation of my comment on joint declaration. That's why I was asking for clarification. Yeah, okay. um, Hong Kong decora joint declaration between China and UK, in our view, complete admission. You know, the agreement is for smooth handover of Hong Kong. Uh, I think what the British, I, I think there's a, a misinterpretation of this joint declaration. I think, first, um, we believe uh, the joint declaration have completed admission. It's registered with the UN, that's right. But that does not mean it's still functioning now. It's complete, so we regard it as a historic document. I think uh, many people question uh, whether China will uh, honor its commitment to this so-called joint declaration uh, with one country, two systems. Uh, that is your main concern. You mentioned about one country system. China still remain committed to one country, two system, because we believe this is not only in the interest of Hong Kong, but also in the interest of China to have one country, two system. That's the problem. But you have to remember, this promise is not made to UK. This is a unilateral declaration made by China to the Chinese people, including people in Hong Kong, and has been now incorporated in the basic law, which is a supreme law governing Hong Kong. So you meant, I, I think uh, 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 what happened in the past few weeks uh, surrounding this amendment exactly shows that one country, two system still working. Uh, Hong Kong government run its own affairs according to their needs, uh, necessity to amend law to make Hong Kong a better place, not a safe haven for fugitive criminals. And uh, Larry, uh, Karen Lan took no order from central government, received no instructions from central government to amend this ordinance. Yet, some forces, some media, tried to portray this event as Karen Lam you know, made decision and the instruction of the central government, and the central government have destroyed or have done something 
to damage one country, two systems. And we also heard that some foreign government, foreign ministers expressed concern about one country, two systems. To put, to quote an English proverb, if I'm right, I would say, they bark at the wrong tree. Is that? Barking up the wrong tree. Barking <laughs> up the wrong tree. They missed the target. We are committed. You know, we, as a matter of fact, what they are doing is interfere into Hong Kong internal affairs, interfere into independent jurisdiction. So like the Hong Kong government to handle this. So we showed our full support of Hong Kong government when they decided to amend it, but when they suspended, we also express our understanding, support. Um, we believe that Carol Lam and her administration is capable to carry its duties. So I do hope that Hong Kong public will respond positively to uh, uh, Chief Executive and her administration and try to work out a solution uh, which ensure prosperity and stability of Hong Kong. That was a somewhere yeah. Mm -hmm. Good morning. That was a very good in conversation by both of you. Thank you. I'm Trevor Sesford, Bank of China International. Uh, during the conversation, it sparked a thought in my head. In China, it was mentioned that the west of China, the um, GDP per head is lower than the eastern seaboard. And in Europe, the, the eastern side of Europe is lower relative GDP compared to the west. Uh, I would think both regions would have a, an interest in closing that relative gap within each region. Which do you think will do it better or be quicker? <laughs> uh, would, you, would, you, would, would you repeat allowed, your... Both of us are allowed to try and answer that yeah, question. Yeah, so is that a question <laughs> or is that a statement? Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a question. Which will, <laughs> will, will China close the gap between the West and the East more quickly than Europe will close the gap between West and East. Is, yeah. I think that's. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a difficult to say. Yeah. Uh, but we certainly would like to compare notes with the Europeans. And, uh, uh, but if you want to have a friendly competition, we would not be uh, objective to it. Uh, um, I, I think different regions have uh, different features. Um, and, and, and China's West is more underdeveloped than Eastern Europe, I would say. Uh, so there's more work to do, and uh, we, we, we can share our experience uh, with uh, our Eastern European uh, countries, uh, how to get, get richer quicker, how to catch up with the more developed areas. Thank you. I, I, I mean, I think this is a complicated uh, question to, to, to answer. Um, it, 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 the ambassador is exactly right. The, the, the discrepancy is greater in China than it is in Europe. Although there are some pockets of real poverty in Eastern Europe. On the whole, uh, these are countries that have a different experience of emerging from um, the Soviet empire, if I can use that phrase, uh, in most cases, and uh, with, with rather distorted economies with pockets of strength in, in them. It's, it's a very different uh, position. Um, and uh, the other difference, of course, is that China is one country. Um, uh, the, the European Union is, largely speaking, still a federation of a number of different countries, and some of them are grinding their axes very, uh, uh, very sharply vis-a-vis um, -vis the EU. Um, and, of course, Poland and Brussels are, in, are still in acrimonious dispute. So it's a complicated story. I, I, I'm not sure I'd care to guess the answer, and the starting conditions aren't exactly the same. We, we've probably got time for one more question. James. <laughs> Chairman has the last to say. I don't have the last say. You have the last say, yeah. Ambassador or, or uh, Chairman Stephen Green. I mean, for, first of all, I just wanted to congratulate you and your colleagues on the success of Vice Premier Hu Chunhua's visit um, last week, which I think in the context of some of the things you were saying earlier in response to the Huawei question, as you know, I believe the, the you know, whether we like it or not, UK politicians are coming under unprecedented pressure from other allies um, on a whole range of, of, of issues 
China linked and non-China linked. And I think the best demonstration to our politicians here of the win-win, the opportunities between the UK and China are to have more visits um, uh, like uh, Vice Premier Hu's last week and the 69 outcomes or whatever it was. But I, I, I wasn't going to ask you about that. But, but go back to the WTO, because I'm, an, I'm rather ignorant about the details of this. I well understand that, that China's accession to the WTO in 2001 was a critical part of China's engagement with the multilateral system. I also hear loud and clear you and other Chinese officials and British ministers talking about the reform of the WTO. But as a non-expert on these things, I do wonder whether, and we have a trade, well, we have two trade experts, but one particular expert here, so this is addressed to both of you. First of all, is meaningful reform of the WTO possible, and what parts of the WTO system are or should China and the UK be working on to get some traction? Because I read that um, the appellate system is, is critical, but I'm not sure that China is engaged in trying to drive that forward, but the US wants to opt out, so is that a blind alley? I, I hear people talking about reform of the notification system, but again, I'm not sure that China is engaged in that, and I just wonder whether it's all a kind of sort of, I mean, should we be talking about it, or is it all impossible? Mm. Uh, you want to go ahead? Let, let, let me go first. Uh, yeah. If, uh, on, on the WTO, my, my last blast as trade minister in the coalition government uh, was that I was the European vice chair at the ministerial meeting in Bali in 2013. Um, and it was the one and only time that the WTO ever produced uh, a, an agreement, actually. I don't, <laughs> I'm not claiming that it was because I was there <laughs> for one second. Um, but we did produce the Trade Facilitation Agreement, which is the only a formal agreement of the WTO that has ever been uh, produced since it was founded. Uh, and the Trade Facilitation Agreement, for those of you who uh, don't know it, is, is about a, some very mundane technical procedures to facilitate cross-border trade. And you read this, and you, it is very difficult to avoid falling asleep when you read the, uh, when you, when you read the detail of it. Um, and it's all to the benefit, almost largely to the benefit of Africa, particularly intra-African trade. There are 40-some different countries in Africa, um, many of whom are landlocked. Um, the the cross-border impediments to trade are ridiculous, and this was all about trying to dismantle unnecessary blockages to internal trade amongst some of the poorest countries on the planet, and the benefits of it will be so powerful. Um, it required technical assistance to, to support it from the developed countries, and I think there was a good agreement on that front. China was supportive. Um, I learned something about international politics of these institutions uh, because the two, there were three big opponents of it, or three, two big ones and one smaller one. There was Cuba, uh, South Africa, and India. Um, and, and each of them was grinding a particular axe. And at the end of the end, it isn't a voting matter. There's a, it's, it's an agreement is acclaimed by, 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 by a sort of mysterious consensus when the director general is comfortable that consensus has been met. And that we got to at 2 o'clock one morning. So there it is. Um, it's an example of the value of the World Trade Organization. It's also a demonstration of how difficult it is to reform it. I think we should encourage it. Uh, I think we have a collective interest in encouraging the strengthening of the WTO, its dispute re resolution procedures, um, and its um, uh, the, 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 the sort of various um, um, uh, plurilateral arrangements to, to develop uh, services. Um, free trade, etc. This is all humdrum, boring work, but it's profoundly important. Of course, for China, um, there is the question of market economy status, which has been a difficult um, source of, uh, of, of concern, both in China and in the EU and the US. And, of course, recently China dropped a case against, or in the WTO context, um, I, I guess because it knew it was not going to be able to win it against the combined forces of the EU and the US about whether or not uh, market economy status should, should indeed be recognised and the implications of that. Uh, I, 
I don't actually think we've got time to take you through all of the minutiae of that. Uh, and to me, the, the, the simple message in a kind of more general context is we need to keep working at it. The WTO cannot be either taken for granted or dismissed as unimportant. I think we can spend the whole day on WTO. I hope uh, CBBC should arrange a seminar on WTO. Uh, the purpose for WTO reform is to make it um, uh, reflect the current, the change of the world situation and uh, to reflect the demand of developing countries. You know, when WTO first set up, uh, it's mainly the developed country have a larger say. And we hope that developing countries' interests could be taken good care of. Uh, the purpose should make WTO uh, to ensure a free tree, facilitate, continue to facilitate the tree, and to build a common world economy rather than closed. Uh, includes, uh, should make it more inclusive. China has uh, uh, presented uh, its uh, paper or a suggestion about WTO reform, I think, two weeks ago. So uh, I, can, I can send you a copy if you are interested in uh, the details. You can compare with China's position, uh, with the UK, with other develop, uh, developing, developing countries. I, I think I quite agree with uh, Lord Green that China and UK share a great deal to strengthen the WTO. As I said, there's no other, there's no other better mechanism uh, regime than WTO now in terms of a facilitating tree, in terms of uh, uh, settling the dispute among nations. You need to have a, you know, something like uh, arbitration a court, you know, some international body to help people to do trade in a friendly business way. So uh, uh, we do hope that countries can work together to make WTO not perfect, but better. Thank we, you. That, that's a note that we ought to wrap, on, uh, uh, wrap up on. Um, we could clearly have gone on for a long time. I could see uh, a whole number of hands, and there were probably some out there in that corner of the room too looking for further questions. So we could clearly have kept going, but we promised you uh, a, a particular schedule, and we've covered a lot of ground. I'd love to have had more, but, but I, I, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. It's been a fantastic conversation. We've covered such a sweep of material. Thank you very much for uh, sharing your insights with us. Thanks for very much for allowing us to be part of the conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking the ambassador and Lord Green. <laughs>